This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. Good evening, friends, and welcome back to Paranormal Stakeout. I'm your host, Larry Lawson, coming to you from the mothership of paranormal programming, the X-Zone Broadcast Network. As always, folks, it's my goal, my job, my duty to present to you, my listeners, with guests and commentary that will challenge your views of the paranormal. Here in Paranormal Stakeout, we champion research and the search for intellectual truth in our quest to prove, beyond a reasonable doubt, the existence of worlds beyond our own. To do that, I look for those investigators, researchers, and practitioners to be on the show, who are in the field, on the line, conducting those investigations and gathering the evidence to prove beyond a reasonable doubt our case that the paranormal exists. And tonight, I uh, got a great guest for you folks. It's been a long week, and I'm really happy to be to be back with all of you, spending this hour together, and particularly happy to present to you our guest, uh, Mr. Chris George, brother law enforcement officer from the state of California. Uh, growing up in historic Leadville, Colorado, interaction with the paranormal came to Chris at a young age. From the time he was eight years old, he had encounters that often defied explanation. After high school, Chris went off to college and received a bachelor's degree in parks and recreational management on his way to becoming a law enforcement park ranger. Chris also studied at UCLA in their paranormal psychology program for a bit. In 1996, Chris co-founded Anibus Paranormal Research Organization, after honing his skills as an investigator with a team in his native Colorado. Chris has also had the opportunity to spend a great deal of time studying the hauntings aboard the former luxury ocean liner Queen Mary, which is currently docked in California. It was here that he had the opportunity to work with renowned paranormal researcher Peter James. Chris is also one of the lead figures in the National Ghost Hunting Day, which uh, premiered last October that many of us were involved in, and is working with the Learning Channel on a new project involving, involving haunted items. Chris is also currently working on his book, The Park's Darkest Path, a collection of ghost stories and spooky tales from America's parks. His website is anubis, A-N-U-B-I-S, paranormal.wix.com, forward slash A-P-R-O, and his email is anubisparanormalresearch.org, at gmail.com. Chris, welcome to the show, my friend. Well, thank you, Larry. I'm, I'm really honored to be here tonight. Well, I'm, I'm excited to talk with you. Uh, being a brother cop, uh, we look at evidence and things the same way and uh, investigations a little bit the same way. So I'm really anxious to, to kind of just share some ideas, ideas with you. Um, what I'd like to know, what, for how in the world... What got you started in the paranormal? I know you had a lot of experiences as a child. Why don't you tell us about it? Well, it's, it's ironic because I think the paranormal world actually touches you instead of you touching it. Um, as, as you pointed out in your introduction there, uh, I began at a very, very young age, it seems. And I was completely unaware of ghosts or things that go bump in the night, but they apparently were aware of me. And uh, in this particular case, when I was quite young, I, I, I'd have to say anywhere between five and eight, I started seeing what I thought were real people, but they were visiting me in the evening. And uh, they were always men, and they were more like shadow people, but yet you could still see some definition with them. And often I thought it was just you know, my father or my older brother playing tricks on me, and I would talk with them, and they would give me a little bit of a response. Not much, but just a little bit. And uh, finally, as I started growing older, I started realizing, wait a minute, this just doesn't seem right. And uh, the more it happened, the more I put things together. And uh, Leadville, if nobody's aware of it, uh, it's famous for Molly Brown, who was on the Titanic. Uh, but in the late 1800s, uh, it was a huge mining district. In mm -hmm. fact, it was almost the capital for the state of Colorado. There were more people in Leadville than there were anywhere else in the uh, state of Colorado at that time. 
But with that mining comes a lot of tragedy, and you had uncounted deaths in those locations. Well, where I lived just happened to be right up against an old mine shaft that had been closed down for quite a while. And mm-hmm. uh, so that, I think, is where it all started. And even today, it, uh, um, I, I still sense things. I don't actually really see the ghosts or hear the ghosts as much as I sense them. And, um, are, are you a sensitive? I, I believe I am. I believe okay. I am. I've never really been clair, uh, clairvoyant or anything along those lines, but mm-hmm. I seem to know where to go, and they seem to know how to contact me. And uh, so usually I'll go into a place, and right off I'll know if something's not just right. Sometimes mm-hmm. it'll be just that feeling in the back of your head or, or uh, just a, a heaviness within the room. And uh, so it it kind of carried on with that during my teenage years. But my, my passion growing up in Colorado was also being outdoors. And so I decided to go ahead and pursue my career goal, which is that of a, being a park ranger. And uh, I've had the honor of not only being a ranger, but going through the different stages up to a chief park ranger position. So it, it's a little bit of both worlds. But I did find out that by doing so, I also was going into areas that were also haunted um, in the parks, a mm-hmm. lot of the historical district parks, uh, the old buildings, the old towns, the old uh, national monuments and so forth mm-hmm. are very active mm-hmm. with paranormal activity. Okay. And uh, so I was able to well, utilize my day job and my night job. Great. I'm going to need to cut you a little bit short here, my friend. I appreciate the intro, but we need to go to our first break in just a few seconds here. But I'm okay. with Chris George, a paranormal investigator with Anibus Paranormal Research Organization. And folks, we're going to be right back on the other side after this break. This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. How would you like to be able to read other people's minds? Well, the next best thing is here. When you know how to read a person's name, you know how the person thinks, feels, and behaves. Each letter in our name holds a key to unlock our true essence. Our name contains both our gifts and challenges in this lifetime. Nemology science discovers personality secrets hidden in the placement of the letters of our names, including the first and last impression people remember about us. Sharon shows us how to interpret the arrangement of letters as outlined in her book, Know the Name, Know the Person. Sharon Lynn Wyeth created Nemology Science after 18 years of research and testing her theories and has supported thousands of people around the world in understanding themselves and others better. You'll enjoy Sharon's unique teachings as she shares her system to learn the gifts behind your given birth name. Even if you don't like your birth name, there are jewels in this book. If you're thinking of changing your name, ready to name your child, or wanting to get along better with others, this is the book for you. If you'd like to improve your relationships and change your life for the better, get the book today, Know the Name, Know the Person, or visit www.knowthename.com. That's www.knowthename.com. Take a step back in time and discover old Florida cuisine at Marsh Landing Restaurant in Felsmere, Florida. Enjoy delicacies such as frog legs, gator tail, catfish, and swamp cabbage, or enjoy the more traditional cuisine such as hand-cut Angus steaks, ribs, and seafood. Join us for breakfast with a southern flair featuring sweet potato pancakes, biscuits and gravy, and much more. Planning a party? Marsh Landing's private dining rooms can accommodate groups from 8 to 80 people. While you visit, enjoy the historic pictures, artifacts, and stories that line the walls. Marsh Landing is truly a unique experience. Marsh Landing Restaurant, 44 North Broadway in historic downtown Felsmere, or visit marshlandingrestaurant.com. Marsh Landing, 
Old Florida cuisine at its best. If you're a seeker, don't miss the inspiring book, Shamanic Awakening, Between the Dark and the Daylight. This remarkable work chronicles shamanic counselor and indigenously trained dream decoder, Sandra Cochran's 35 years of experience with diverse wisdom keepers throughout the Americas. Sandy's initiations across the British Isles, Turkey, Greece, and Egypt, combined with her knowledge of symbology, psychology, and myth, influence her dream blog and workshops. Sandy offers private readings, Sacred International Journeys, a meditative CD, and her book, Shamanic Awakening, to encourage you as you navigate your earthwalk and create a deeper connection to yourself. Find this and more at her website, starwalkervisions.com. And welcome back to Paranormal Stakeout. I'm your host, Larry Lawson, and we have Chris George with us tonight, uh, law enforcement chief park ranger out in uh, the great state of California. And really interesting stuff you shared with us on, on how you you were introduced to the paranormal. I'm sure your story is similar to a lot of young folks over the years. Um, what is What does the paranormal mean to you personally, Chris? And... In that, I'd like to know what's your definition of what, what's a ghost, if you can add those two well, things in there. From all of the experiences that I've had over 30-some-plus odd years being in this field, uh, I've encountered a lot of things that would make me look at the paranormal world from two different directions. One from the logical science aspect, and then the other from literally taking a leap of faith. Uh, this science is a science that has so much evidence to back it up, but there is no proof to substantiate it. Most of our proof is in the form of photographs or EVPs or anything mm-hmm. electromagnetic or electronic, as I should say, okay. that can actually easily be reproduced, especially nowadays. And it really throws a lot of murkiness into the water as to what is authentic, what is not authentic. And I really am looking at this from the point of science, as I always have. Uh, I always wanted to try and and disprove everything before I could actually jump to that next conclusion of, is it paranormal? Because once you do, then you're putting your neck out a little bit and saying, I believe this. I believe that this is what's taking place. And in the world of paranormal, that not only includes hauntings, but it includes... UFOs and alien abductions. Oh, absolutely. And absolutely. And, and that's the one thing that Anubis Paranormal Research Organization deals with is just not the one thing. We go out and we investigate all levels of the okay. paranormal. And uh, we have each team is divided up into their professional uh, stance so that they can deal with that particular issue. And we go out and we do it just like a crime scene. A crime scene. We okay, in- interview the people, we look at the evidence, uh, we investigate the process, and then we come back with a conclusion. But first and foremost, you've got to be able to determine whether the people out there are actually experiencing what they claim to be experiencing, just like in, we're talking about law enforcement. You can't just go up and inter- interview somebody after a crime without taking in all the facts first before you can actually start the step. Absolutely. Now, let me ask you this, since you headed down the road that I was going to go later anyway, let's head right to it. And that's the collection of, of evidence. You're right. We take photographs, we get EVPs, um, and people are very quick to say, this is evidence. But as, as an investigator, and in our group the same way, we collect evidence uh, using tried-and-true law enforcement techniques. Right. Why don't all groups do that? Now, granted, nobody, not everybody's trained, but I'm, I'm st- where I'm heading with this is standardization of investigations throughout the industry, if you will. And, it all and goes I'm, back, yeah, I think where it all goes back to, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no, after you. No, no, oh, please, okay. go ahead. Um, where I think it goes back to, Larry, is that so many people, years ago when I got started in this, uh, I was a teenager, 
when I really started to seriously look at this. And when I was in college, everybody called us the spooky kids or the kooky kids. It wasn't the cool thing it is today. And with successful shows like uh, um, Ghost Adventures and uh, all the others on TV, people have kind of stepped into this thinking, oh, I can do this. Look at that. That's mm-hmm. easy. All I have to do is just buy the equipment and I'll go into a dark place and, and I'll find a, a, a spirit or a ghost exactly. or a cryptid. And they become armchair experts when in reality there are no real experts because it's an unknown. But those of us that have the experience and the, the basic mindset, we collaborate with each other. Um, mm-hmm. International Ghost Hunters Day, or, or National Ghost Hunters Day, I should say, was an attempt to unify the paranormal world. Exactly. Unfortunately, there are many out there that covet their prizes. They're all looking out for themselves. And mm-hmm. I'm, not, I'm not disrespecting any or, a group out there that really want to go out, and uh, it's a couple people, one person, a, a large group. It's going into places not knowing the safety elements involved. And I don't mean just from the paranormal world, but you go into a decrepit old house exactly. that's off a beaten trail, and nobody knows that you're out there, and you fall through a rotted floor and hurt yourself, you're going, you're going to exactly. pay for it in more different ways than, than, than the paranormal is going to get you. But it's these things, these practices that are not being followed. And it, it really cripples the industry in general how many you know we're starting to see now and now more people that have been killed by accidental means than by sheer fright okay then Literally. then let let me get let me get to this point like i said this was going to hit you a little bit later on this uh, in the show on this but this is a good time to bring it up okay. i personally advocate the use of standardized structure and training in order to bring the uh, the industry, as we'll call it, or the field, into line so that we can all investigate the same way, therefore collect the evidence the same way, and have data that is uh, taken with a, a tried and true methodology that we can either prove or disprove our evidence. Would you agree? Absolutely, 100%. Okay. And with that comes the structure of how to do it, but also the training that comes with it prior to folks going out, as you put it, I like that armchair investigators going out because it it can be dangerous. I mean, we've been in spots, I'm sure you have too, where uh, physically it can be very, very dangerous. Mm -hmm. Why do you think that we're not there yet as investigators? Again, it, it goes back to this mindset of, I want me to be the star on the television show. I want my work to be the definitive proof that creates this doorway that will open to everyone else. It's a jealousy factor. I hate to say it, but it is indeed that point. You you start to see it even on the television shows to a certain degree. Mm -hmm. Um, And we have got to forget about the me factor and start realizing it's about the us factor discovering these mysteries. And only through unification, only through a combined effort of knowledge and work and cooperation, are we going to find the answers. Otherwise, well, you know, it's going to be he said, she said, and everybody else said. You know, what's kind of funny is, and in, in, in being around law enforcement, as long as you have, we both have, um, that's the way it was in our business for so many years. Yes. People absolutely. people would have a case and they wouldn't share their evidence with the town next door. Um mm-hmm. and, and so they could get the, the glory of the uh of the of the, the case. And and because of that we were not sharing vital information. Uh, there are cases where serial killers went uh went on for long periods of time because people weren't sharing information. So uh, you know, there's no question that there, are, there, there's ego involved, but I also think some of it's a little bit of human nature, and we've got to overcome mm-hmm. it because what's the old adage? There's no I in team. It's got exactly. to be all together for us to reach that goal that is so important to those of us that want to find the answers. So I, I agree Absolutely. with you a thousand percent there. Well, even in within our organization, we share. Excuse me, we share a lot of uh, our materials. If people want. Uh, 
our resources, to utilize our resources, we are more than happy to help them out. Even if it's another team, an individual, whatever. Uh, because there again, it's, it's about exploring together to, con- to confirm exactly. and, and to really prove this. If, it's a, if we are truly paranormal investigators, mm-hmm. then we need to investigate using and utilizing the tools and expertises of those around us. Uh, Amen. You cannot be an all-know-it. No, you can't. And that's one reason why I strongly advocate. And, you know, there, there's variations of how you do things, but a, a certain standard set of rules, guidelines that if we can, if, I believe that if we all start using and therefore collect the evidence the same way, we're going to get the evidence. See, I, I'm kind of a, how to put this, um, not a visionary. That's not the word I'm looking for. Maybe I'm too hopeful, but I believe in my heart that by coming together, working together, sharing the information, we will eventually find that answer, those answers that we're looking for, whether it be cryptids, whether it be UFOs, whether it be ghosts. I believe we as human beings have that ability to find that answer if we all work together. And, um, and that's kind of where I'm at now. In fact, uh, I'm going to tell you right now, and I'm going to put you on the spot, my friend. <laughs> I'm going to try and put something together, and I want you to be part of it, and I want our listeners out there that are part of groups to be part of it, and that's the coming together as a unified front to set the standards for our field, for our industry. Are you with me? Absolutely. I okay. 100%. And this is the only way, like you're saying, that we are going to make leaps and bounds in this science. And uh, I think it's like the old, the old adage, you put a bunch of sticks together, you can't break it. You have one stick. It can well bust. said. Well said. And, and I think this is the route we need to take. Well, and I also, and, and you know, we've got to do it also, and this is once again my, my, my opinion, you can't sit there and, and with a gal and say it's my way or the highway. We have to come together as a field and decide what best practices are. And from that, create the standards which most of us, not everybody's always going to agree, but which most of us can live by and set those standards for investigation. So that's my goal. That's my vision. So I, I got that out there tonight. <laughs> well, I think you're not alone, to be honest, Larry. I think there are a lot of, of us that have been in this field for a long time, even though it may not be our primary job in life or, or it may be just a hobby there is inside of us all that want to know the answers. We want to know if there's something beyond this existence or is there life on another planet or what was that thing I just saw in the woods? Mm -hmm. Those things are all great mysteries. We in the 21st century, we have this this archaic sense that we know everything when in Mm -hmm. fact we know so little. And by joining forces, by combining those efforts and sharing those ideas, we'll be able to have a round table of groups from all around the world that will be able to say, you know, I think you're right, but let's look at it from this point as well. Let's step out of that box for just a minute and walk in my world and mm-hmm. then come back to it and say, you know, after reanalyzing it, maybe this is the answer. Yeah. But there again, we never would have known it unless somebody else spoke it. Well, and, and, and that's happened to us in law enforcement for years, you know, we finally, oh, we, we've got a case here. We finally get information for a case in California. Oh, my God, it's the same guy. Yes. It's, a, it, exactly. it's, it's the sharing of evidence. It's the sharing of, of information that, that is so vital. What are your thoughts on the creation of a general data bank, not four or five or six, but a general data bank that with which uh, we can put evidence that anybody that's within the group that that's part of our, our field uh, can go to and look at and compare with what they have. What's your thoughts on that? I think it's a great idea, but there's one thing that I would add to it okay. that in the, in the depositing of this information that we have a, a, not just one individual, but maybe three or oh, four individuals a board, from a, board. a variety of place, yeah. a board yeah. that would determine the authenticity of the evidence. Yeah, we would have to. Do that. Well, you know, we're going to have to take our, our uh, next break right now. When we get back on the other side, let's talk about the creation of, of a board, if you will, or a group of people that could be uh, could be flexible in discussing that. So when we come back from our break, chew on that a little bit. We're going to talk about that some more. And uh, folks, we're going to see you on the other side as we take our next break. This is Larry Lawson 
and Paranormal Stakeout. We'll be back shortly. This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. There's a legend shared by many indigenous cultures of a time when the nations were cast to the four corners of the world. Each nation was given a body of sacred knowledge that held a different portion of the truth to preserve. True reality could not be known until all the nations reunited, combining the information. If a single one was missing, the world could not be reborn and darkness would prevail. The Science of Magic Radio is dedicated to reuniting the sacred knowledge. With the understanding, none of us has all the answers, but together we can open new perceptions and possibilities. Through our combined vision, the world can be reborn into a place where darkness no longer prevails. Join me, Gwilda Wiecka, and the Science of Magic daily on the Exxon Broadcast Network, xzbn.net, or visit us at thescienceofmagic.net. Gibbs A. Williams, Ph.D., is a practicing psychoanalyst, supervisor, researcher, and author in New York City. Much of his life has been dedicated to understanding nature and the uses of meaningful coincidences or synchronicities. His radical and original non-Jungian, non-mystical, non-magical theory of synchronicities illuminates much of the fog surrounding this challenging and perplexing topic. His ideas and manners are fresh, presented in a style that is both entertaining and highly informative. He is also an expert on crisis intervention specially focused on violence reduction for the police and citizens, mastering anxiety, frustration and stress without the use of medication, and effectively preventing and treating heroin addiction. Dr. Williams can be contacted at his email address at gwwilliamsny11 at aol.com or visit his website at... Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the Exxon Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X-1, Dimension X, Space Patrol, and every minute of the Exxon Broadcast Network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan, and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere, 24-7, 365. True healing must address four levels, physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual, for us to live joyful and productive lives. We tend to treat three of the four, leaving the spiritual languishing. If you're tired of the same dysfunctional patterns cropping up in your life, soul balancing is for you. Trixie Phelps, owner and founder of Soul Balancing, is a naturally gifted energy healer trained in numerous esoteric forms, including shamanism. Trixie has created a powerful modality that safely and effectively clears your energetic field. A soul balancing session can remove interference, heal trauma, and restore your hope. Contact Trixie for a life-changing long-distance session today, www.soulbalancing.world. Welcome back to Paranormal Stakeout with my guest, Chris George. We're having a great conversation tonight and uh, talking about the structuring of uh, 
paranormal investigations and uh, really like your thoughts and, and, and where you're going with that, my friend. Um, I do want to go back to, to one thing. We were talking a little bit about uh, working working with uh, groups and boards to help put things together, and that's something we're going to, you know, I'd like to talk a little bit about and develop in the future. Sure. I want to back up just a little bit because yeah. one thing that's always kind of frustrated me, for lack of a better word, is people, uh, the different um, definitions of ghosts. I'd like yeah. to know what yours is. What do you think a ghost is? To be honest with you, I do believe from, again, all of my experiences, that it is mm-hmm. the disembodied intelligence or consciousness of a human person or living individual. I, mm-hmm. And by that, I mean even an animal to a certain degree. And um, and I can even go into that a little bit because people say, well, animals really shouldn't have souls. But yes, they do. If we love an animal, we're imparting energy into that animal, that consciousness, that awareness, and they are making a bond with us. And thus, after death, I truly believe that for an extended period of time, they do linger around. And I mm-hmm. believe that the dead, ourselves, being intellectuals, being um, spirit energy, as you could say, that we do continue. As, as uh, the science has put it, uh, energy cannot be destroyed. It can only change shape. And uh, I believe wholeheartedly that spirit can go to the other side. Now, whether that be heaven or uh, some other realm or other some dif- different definition, it's pretty much the same thing. We transfer into a different state of being, a different state of evolutionary aspect. But the mm-hmm. door for us on this side only swings one way. But for them, I believe it swings both ways. And they can come back. And for many, many, many years, I did not believe in reincarnation. To be mm-hmm. honest with you, I do now. I believe What changed your mind? Just certain aspects. In fact, if, if we had about six hours, I could tell you about a regression that I myself went through that I, I didn't believe in. I, I, I sat down completely convinced that uh, it was a bunch of hooey. And I mm-hmm. was brought up Catholic, and so in, in the Catholic faith, they, they, they tend to say that that's not possible. But there are so many things that happen not only to myself, but also interviewing children that uh, really surprised me that these children, uh, very young children, that were able to tell stories about previous families, previous lives, and then you research it and find out, oh my goodness, it's absolutely correct. How did this child know this? Mm-hmm. Because it had some substantial historical proof to back it up, whereas uh, the parents had no knowledge, but the child did, and so forth. Well, are you referring to the young boy that uh, that had visions of being a fighter pilot during the Second World War? That's one friend? of them, but, yep. but there are others, a lot of them that are not even uh, recorded, that I myself have investigated. Okay. And uh, just to hear their stories and then just to go back and do the research and literally find out that there was a connection. There was some basic knowledge of a family that was here in Southern California, for instance, uh, back in the 20s that uh, lived in Paramount. And uh, this boy actually was living in San Diego at the time. He was four years old, and he was talking about his family. He was describing mm-hmm. this location. Uh, we were able to go back through land grants and, and land deeds and find that there was a family by what he said. Uh, there were X amount of children. He, he said he was the father of these three boys. The boys confirmed. Now, the parents had no idea. They were Im- immigrant families, so they did not mm-hmm. have the resources. This is a case you to, investigated. Exactly. Okay. To be able right. to, to substantiate this connection. They weren't looking for any profit. They didn't want their names known. They just were worried about their son because their son was talking about this other family. Mm-hmm. And they didn't understand where it was coming from. So those are the cases that, that really kind of scratch your head and go, okay, there is something. But like I said, even within my own regression, many of my childhood fears were realized because of the result of a previous life. Mm-hmm. And I never understood why. Why was I in law enforcement? Why was I involved in the rich history of the outdoors and things like that? Or why was I, now I'm a good swimmer. I swim in the swimming pool all the time, but I am absolutely petrified of the ocean. Mm-hmm. And well, 
Go ahead. You know, it's just it just just the connection of things that that have interested me as a child, but made no real sense. But mm-hmm. I learned, later learned out that in a previous life I actually drowned. So <laughs> it that, was like, that's, oh, yeah, I guess that, I guess that puts a cap on that. Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, th- this is an area where uh, I've evolved enough in my work, as, if you will, to not discount anything anymore but the cop side of me the cop side of me wants to say prove that and and that's that's the uh, connection that we've got to make and i want to talk to you a little bit about uh technology what what's it going to take for us to be able to prove that or are we are we never going to prove it and are we just kind of like uh uh, hitting our heads up against the wall, even trying to prove something like that. What are your thoughts? I think it goes down to two different roads. First off, for the last 100 years, people have been trying to make uh, machines that could talk with the dead. Even Edison did that. He wanted to have his spirit phone, and he was working on that prior to his death. Uh, spirit photography of the 1800s, uh, we're still doing all of these things. Sometimes the basic proof is the best proof. We can build all sorts of great and wondrous technological uh, devices, but the problem is somebody's going to come along and say, and eh, don't think so. Eh, you could fake this so easily by doing A, B, and C, which is mm-hmm. true. You can. Mm-hmm. And it's, it, but it was the same 100 years ago. It was easily disproved. Okay. The, the issue is until they're ready, I think, and I mean this across the board, as when you say spirit. when they're ready, or spirit, okay. Yeah, the paranormal world is ready, then it'll happen. It's it, kind of like even with uh, extraterrestrials. Yeah, there's a lot of proof out there that something is going on, but we still don't have somebody shaking the president's hand. We gotcha. don't have Bigfoot's carcass lying in a, in a, uh, a veterinary clinic being autopsied. Oh, yeah, let's have, uh, Let's pray so, that doesn't I mean, happen on that crazy show they're showing right now. <laughs> they want to kill exactly. Bigfoot. Exactly. And so, it, it, again, there is so much proof to back all of these areas up with. But the proof has to be substantial, too. It has to, as we always say, hold up in court. And, that's in, and that is my goal, and I've got to be honest with you. I'm unwavering on that belief that we will we will sometime somehow someday get there but beyond that what do we need to do today where do you think the technology is going to take us i mean let's face it uh i i I don't disagree with you maybe when the other side's ready is when we'll find out but what can we do from the technology side or are, are we heading in the right direction even i think one of the things is uh that we need as a group of individuals paranormal not just in uh, scientists and, and, and so on, but the paranormal community in general that has individuals that are expertise in electronics and, uh, and uh, device making uh, should be involved into the next steps. They, mm-hmm. You don't send out a plumber to do heart surgery. You send <laughs> out a, a, a surgeon to do that. And right. we need people in our field that can know basically what it's going to take working together and coming up with new ideas to create new and improved equipment. Well, see, so and, that, I, and I personally believe we're going to do that. I mean, a hundred, a mm-hmm. hundred years ago, 150 years ago, they laughed at the thought of man flying. And now we're talking finally about go, even going back to the moon. So I believe we will reach that point. We will make that discovery. I guess I'm just getting angry. Happen. It's only going to happen if we work together. And, exactly. And, and that's Larry, that, my hope. That's the problem right now is we're not working together. There are steps being taken with uh, uh, National, Par- uh, National Ghost Hunting Day, but mm-hmm. that's the first step. I'm even involved in developing a new association, an international paranormal research organization, mm-hmm. and uh, international-wise. Because, again, one of the great wonders that we have is social media. We all can talk to each other. We can all express our opinions. But then again, you get the groups out there that are, are, are really trying to push it, and they're not 
well, you know what I mean. But yeah. overall, the communication of the world has gotten a lot smaller, and we're able to actually reach out to people across the world, uh, Europe and uh, well, Africa. This, and this, brings up a, this brings up a good question then, because there was a lot of talk, especially on National Ghost Hunting Day, uh, on a lot of groups allowed folks to come in and be part of their events with little or no experience, which may or may not have skewed some of the evidence that was collected. Right. right. So I see the argument as to why not, but how else are we going to reach out to folks that have a true desire to learn and be part of this? Well, one of the things that Anubis Paranormal Research does, we never charge for any of our investigations, but what we do do is we uh, have classes on paranormal studies. Uh, And it is broken down into three elements of basically hauntings, uh, UFOs, and cryptids. And you can get a uh, certification. Not, and when you say certification, this is always making everybody jump up and down. But basically from us, certified that you went through our course Mm -hmm. and that you completed this requirement. And uh, in that aspect, we charge and... We give out a basic kit for each of those different segments. Now, if you uh, go through one, you get a certificate. If you get a go through all three, you get a, a, a certificate of completion mm-hmm. and, uh, and a, are an honorary member of, of APRO. But a lot of people say, oh, well, that's great for you and, and what you need. But it, it helps us get our equipment and helps us do things. But it also, just like you're saying, sets a standard. Mm-hmm. Of, of professionalism that I personally uh, feel is important. And uh, again, I utilize my law enforcement training and my, my background and my, my ability to teach and educate to mm. that degree to help people go out and do the safe investigation, do the scientific investigation. And so that they can go out and start their own groups, mm-hmm. but in addition, they can work with us again and share the evidence. And this mm-hmm. is exactly what that both of us are, are speaking about, is trying to develop that bridge, to create that bridge of, of confidence and uh, creativity and knowledge so that we yep. can share in this. And again, it's just bringing the community get together. Now, I and uh, uh, Maria from uh, National, uh, or, uh, uh, National Ghost Hunting Day. No shit. There we go. Uh, we've come up with an idea. We're we're working on something right now for the next one that I think is mm-hmm. going to be really good. Uh, I'm not going to go into too much detail about it. So no, I, I get that. I, I'm kind of familiar with some of it anyway, in, in in talking with Maria. But it's it's exciting, exciting stuff. And I agree with you. This is the direction we need to go as an as a field in order for us to move the entire the entire thing forward. I'm going to. Uh, uh, we're just about ready to take our last break. We're going to do that in just a second here. When we get back, i got a few more questions to ask. I've really enjoyed our conversation, Chris. Um, Thank you. So, so folks, uh, stay with us, and we'll be back in just a few minutes after this break. This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the X-Zone Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X-1, Dimension X, Space Patrol, and every minute of the x Broadcast Network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. 
It saves your data plan and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere, 24-7-365. I am Dr. Carl O'Helvey, founder, president of a new cancer foundation focusing on evidence-based physical, mental, and spiritual interventions, including natural cancer cures, prayer, meditation, affirmations, nutrition, and other related holistic cancer prevention and cure modalities. These are used in cancer education, research, and financing care. I ask for your help to continue this important work by donating at www.holisticcancerfoundation.com. Wouldn't you love to know the secret to everything? I'm Dr. Kimberly McGeorge, and on The Secret to Everything, we will merge the practical with open investigation into all realms of the mysterious. We will talk to cutting-edge alternative health practitioners, those who inspire and motivate you in business and life, and of course, we will share stories of the paranormal, conspiracy, and cryptozoology. You will transform because of the frequency I carry, the frequencies my guests carry. Life may never be the same after you listen to this program. For the secret to everything is for you, the listener, for those who desire more in every area of their lives and believe that it can still be found. Listen and discover the secret to everything.com. Little children aren't the only ones afraid of the dark. Millions of soldiers return from war zones with PTSD, anger, frustration, fear, and loneliness, much of which surfaces during the darkness of the night. You have the chance to change the lives of these American heroes. Songs and Stories for Soldiers.us provides free MP3 players for these men and women. With a list of 3 million songs in 16 different styles, 100,000 audiobooks, and 30,000 old-time radio programs, every veteran can find something to soothe and comfort them at no cost. All our players contain an 8-hour audio program designed to help veterans fall asleep. With 1,500 plus vets now participating, it's our goal to deliver 10,000 audio players this year. Go to our website at songsandstoriesforsoldiers.us. Help us help a veteran make it through the night. Well, welcome back to Paranormal Stakeout with tonight's guest, Chris George. Uh, Please, folks, be sure to stop by George's website at anubisparanormal.wix.com forward slash APRO, or feel free to email him at anubisparanormalresearchorg at gmail.com. I'd also like to invite everybody to tune in to all the outstanding programming on the Exxon Broadcast Network. And you can get the full program schedule at www.xzbn.net uh, to catch all the great shows on the X-Zone Broadcast Network. And obviously, I'd love to have you come by and visit me at www.stakeout.com or www.paranormalfbi.com, my team's website. You can also find us on Facebook at Florida Bureau of Paranormal Investigation. Feel free to contact me also at Larry Lawson at xzbn.net. Chris, it's been an exciting show tonight. We've covered a lot of area. We could probably go on for another six hours, my friend. Um, oh, absolutely. The stories I can tell you. <laughs> oh, well, that's what, tell me, what is the, what's the strangest investigation you ever had? Well, ironically, I would have to say I, there are so many. Uh, that I've done that they kind of bleed together. But I just recently had one where it's, it was actually just locally here in Long Beach. And uh, it was by a homeowners association group that uh, was concerned about a local park, 
ironically enough, me being a ranger, that they had a history of activity in. And it's a very, very small, obscure little neighborhood park here in Long Beach. And uh, it uh, came up with some interesting results. Uh, there was a lot of legends uh, about local Indian tribes that lived here and the massacres that took place, especially on the property near this, this area. And uh, so I went in there with the idea of, okay, well, you know, the stories, it's an urban setting, it's a city setting, you're going to have background noise, pollution, all of the scientific aspects. But to be honest with you, it did turn out to be quite a, a, a big uh, shock to me, some of the evidence that we caught. And uh, mm -hmm. it, it, it included uh, electronic voice phenomena, which, now, mind you, Long Beach is basically a very, uh, it's, it's a mixed population of, of groups, but... Mm -hmm. You don't have Indian tribal music and chanting going on while you're doing an investigation. No, no, I would think not. Urban City Park, and we were getting a lot of this feedback from this. Interesting. And uh, we also, there was a legend of a demon-like creature, and through the research and, uh, and so forth, we found out that the shaman of the tribe actually put a curse on the land. And uh, ironically enough, there was a report of this ghoul or creature-like element and uh, we were doing some photography in this one particular location that had always been a kind of a hotbed for people but we took a photograph and sure enough we saw something very very odd it was four-legged it looked mm -hmm. like it had almost like a human-like head with this really strange tail and another photograph of where there was absolutely no fog mist or anything along those lines in the park mm -hmm. There was a fog-like structure in the photograph that looked like an, uh, an American, uh, Native American Indian woman holding a baby. Interesting. And that, those two, usually when you do an investigation, you might get one or two things that really pop out. Uh, we were getting quite a bit, and that was Interesting. In, in just a three-hour investigation. So it was like a whirlwind of activity in a place that you would never, ever experience. And, and you, you'd all, probably go back there tomorrow, and it would be quiet. <laughs> exactly. The yep. odds of an investigation, as I'm sure you very well know, can take anywhere from a day to three days to a week to a month, even up to a yep. year, to get any actual really good evidence. And Long Beach seems to be a hotbed for activity. It's ironic because I've come full circle. I grew up here as a park ranger. I traveled across the United States back and forth to different locations and different park areas. But coming back here, it seemed to draw me. And, of course, the Queen Mary is always a hotbed. Well, that's, that's where I was going to go next. I mean, obviously, your opportunity work with Peter James, one of, one of the pioneers, if you will, Absolutely. and on the Queen Mary. Tell us about that. Share some of that with us. Ironically, it kind of goes back to that, that point of fascination with ocean liners. And one day we'll have to talk a little bit about that reincarnation element uh, okay. because it deals with ocean liners as well. Um, but as a young boy, I was always being drawn down there. And uh, one day in particular, I was walking along by myself. I'd snuck on the ship, believe it or not, because... I passed the journey. I knew all the ways before, into the before ship. Before or after you became a law enforcement officer? This was before. I was still a teenage boy. So, okay. But I knew all the all the uh, the tricks to get onto the ship. So uh, on this particular day, I was in part of the, the boiler room area, which is uh, an area that you're not supposed to go to. And here was this gentleman. And I was, like, shocked. I thought, oh, no, I'm going to get in big trouble here. And... He, he asked me what I was doing there. I kind of asked him the same thing. He said, ghost hunting. And I said, really? And I said, is this ship really haunted? Well, by that statement, by that question, it opened up a good friendship, a great friendship. And mm -hmm. Peter and I, we, we worked together uh, on and off. And he, he was a very endearing individual, a, a very endearing man and uh, missed greatly by not only myself but many in the paranormal community he opened up a lot of doorways and mm -hmm. was able to really open up that ship beforehand they didn't want anybody to know that it was haunted now it's the big thing come to the <laughs> queen mary the hot spot of hauntings yeah and uh, it because it's a big revenue maker for him but again that element that that i i like to think that peter is still there in some ways when i go aboard the ship um, 
and I can still feel him around me many, many times. But it is, that ship is a plethora of activity. How many and times do you think you've, how many times have you been, uh, done conducted investigations of border? Um, professionally, I've done three. Mm-hmm. Um, on the side by myself or with just a small group of people, oh, 50, 60 times. My goodness. That's, that's, that's an opportunity. <laughs> that's, wow. Well, one of the things that we're looking at doing is down the road, and hopefully if this goes through with uh, National Ghost Hunting Day, is the Queen Mary will be involved in that. Interesting. So they'll, they'll, that will be one of the sites for National Ghost Hunting Day? Well, and maybe I'm kind of stepping out on this. It's now this is again. This oh, is, come on, you can do it. It's in the planning stages, but Marie and I have been discussing about actually having conventions during National Ghost Hunting Day, one on the East Coast and one on the West Coast. Mm-hmm. The West Coast, I'm taking the lead on and am working with her in developing a chap a, a, a convention, literally on the Queen Mary. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Different haunted locations on. Um, uh, west of the Rockies will get together and share basic information and do uh, have lectures, have tours, and so mm-hmm. forth, while she and her group are on the East Coast doing the same thing. I got just a spot for that <laughs> down in good old <laughs> Felsmere, Florida. That's my, my vote anyway. Um, wow, that's, that sounds like a very, very ambitious plan, and it's going to take a lot, of, um, uh, a lot of planning to get that one ready. Exactly, exactly. So we've got uh, we've got work to do, but I think it can uh, again with people that are devoted and, and work together like Maria. She is outstanding, and she and Bob and uh, yeah. um, I look forward to working with them both and and with everybody in the community. Uh, this is uh, I'm going to have a very busy future, I think, and uh, it's kind of surprising again because this has all reached out to me. I haven't reached out to it. So is the wor- is the paranormal world reaching out to us? Maybe it does. It's time. Maybe it, it looks at us and, and touches certain individuals. Well, you just hit on something, and this this probably would be a great way to end our time together tonight. Um, what is your vision? What is your what what is your vision of the future of paranormal investigation? What do you see happening? What I would personally like to see happening is a unified paranormal world, a world of dedicated professionals that work together in obtaining these goals and, and, and sharing these ideas and these mysteries. And instead of knocking each other down and putting each other down all the time uh, or ridiculing one group over another or saying this is that or that is the other, work together to, to promote it in a way that everybody has a voice, everybody has a, has a, has a view, but yet under a specific standard, mm-hmm. a banner, so to speak. Okay. And that we can actually start to certify, and I think that is key, certify groups from a primary source that says we are an organization that will certify you to be a paranormal investigator. Mm-hmm. You have Interesting. A license. You have, a, you have a license, or even to the point of where... Uh, a lot of community colleges and so forth are starting to work together in, in the criminal justice. We could do the same with the paranormal world. And I would, and I would agree with you. And I, Dan, I'd like to talk to you a little bit more about that as, as uh, time goes on. And I'm certainly looking forward to seeing uh, National Ghost Hunting Day. I'm, I'm, anxious to, I'm excited about uh, this next year. I thought the first uh, iteration of it was, was pretty exciting, and I think as we uh, work out some of the kinks, it's going to be really exciting. I'd like to uh, invite all our listeners out there to keep your eyes out on the paranormal websites out there for National Ghost Hunting Day. You'll probably start seeing some things crop up in the next oh, a few months on it. Um, Chris, uh, I really want to thank you for our time together tonight. Uh, you, you've brought up some tremendous thoughts and ideas. Uh, you and I are like-minded in so many ways. I think the future is bright for uh, all of us in the paranormal world as long as we can get past ego and start working together. Wouldn't you agree? Absolutely. Well, okay. Absolutely. That's uh, the only what, way it's going to work. Absolutely. Well, once again, uh, Georgia, uh, go to Chris's website uh, at AnnabasParanormal.wix.com. 
uh, forward slash APRO. And we will see you folks next time on the other side on Paranormal Stakeout. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, everybody. We'll see you next week.